suppose just to get started, Scott, uh, would you mind just outlining uh, to us your system? Because, as you know, we're a little bit different, think. We have, the, we have a, an agency especially that deals with complex uh, enforcement here, the Competition Authority. We do the law ourselves. Um, but in relation to um, your own position in the States, it's a little bit different. You've got a, kind of a, you do some of the work and then the FBI does. Yeah. Could you explain that? Well, actually, your system is much more akin to <clears throat> what you see across the country, across the world, and it's the United States. It's somewhat unique. Uh, and we're unique because the Antitrust Division is both a investigative competition authority as well as a prosecuting authority. So. We get uh, a lot of assistance from the FBI and uh, occasionally from other investigative agencies. For example, if we're working with the Department of Defense, we might use their agents, or if we're working on a road building case, we might be working with agents from our Department of Transportation. Um, so we receive supplemental investigative resources from other agencies, but uh, the antitrust division is also involved at the investigative stage. And then if there is a prosecution, uh, because we're part of the Justice Department, we're also involved in bringing that prosecution. Uh, we are not the executioner, though. We are not uh, a judicial body, and so we're not imposing sentences, uh, um, uh, which you also see in some competition authorities are both investigating and also levying uh, fines or sanctions. Uh, that's The line is drawn there. We, we don't get involved in actual sentencing. So, in a sense, the Irish system is a little bit in between in, in that, like you, we bring our case before courts, not a decision-making body, but unlike you, the whole lot's done on, in one house. We do the investigative work as well as um, you know, bringing cases or whatever else, whereas it's kind of bifurcated in the States. Yeah. Um, just in relation to, uh, I suppose, your own work uh, since this last thing in the last 10 years, is it your experience that cartels are becoming more sophisticated? Are you finding them more difficult to detect? Are they becoming more kind of, uh, I suppose, complex and, and, and how they go about their business. What's your own experience and, and how cartels have been operating? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, that's been my experience. Uh, detection of cartels has been uh, become more difficult. Um, I think we've had a significant deterrent impact in the United States on cartel activity, um, but those cartels that we haven't been able to deter have become more sophisticated to avoid detection. What we did uh, see, many of you, I don't know if many of you have seen the movie The Informant or are familiar with uh, that story, the Lysine cartel that uh, was detected and uh, the, the covert investigation using the FBI. That was our first big international cartel uh, prosecution that was back in the mid-1990s. Uh, after that, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. businesses and consumers continued to be targeted by international cartel activity, but most of those... Um, meetings and conversations uh, began to take place exclusively outside the United States. Um, so in terms of increased sophistication, we saw, uh, we saw that all of the evidence, all the documents, most of the participants were outside of U.S. borders. They were still targeting our market, but they were doing so outside of the United States. We did, uh, and we have seen uh, cartels, though, that operate, have operated around the world, uh, affecting markets around the world, though, that actually stop at our borders. This has become somewhat interesting uh, to observe this because it's, it's been somewhat satisfying to see that we are having a deterrent effect. So these are cartels that, uh, you know, you, um, in an large international cartels that have uh, the U.S. is obviously a very desirable market. It's a very lucrative market. Some of the companies are involved in selling it in the United States, but they have stopped their cartel activity at our borders because of the fear of detection and, and, and to be more blunt, fear going to jail. Um, we learn about some of these cartels because the companies have come forward to seek leniency. Uh, oftentimes they're seeking leniency not just in the United States but in other, in other jurisdictions. The, when they've come forward, they've said that uh, in their internal investigation has revealed that the cartel actually stopped in the U.S., that they were afraid to get uh, U.S. officials or U.S. executives involved in the activity, perhaps afraid of not just, not just of the antitrust division, not just of the FBI, but of general counsel in the U.S. learning about it or, as I said, U.S. executives may be more primed on uh, antitrust laws and more concerned about the consequences of violating the U.S. antitrust laws. Uh, and so these, uh, we've been able to do our own due diligence. We don't usually accept the word of uh, <laughs> counsel Please. saying, don't worry, it stopped in the United States. <clears throat> and those investigations have revealed, in fact, that the cartel activity did not reach into the U.S. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I will say that um, uh, certainly this is some, a conversation that I've had with our colleagues over at the European Union and, and they have everywhere where cartel enforcement has been ramped up over the years is you're going to see what we you know, we experienced in the U.S. many many years ago, which is the documents aren't going to be there anymore. I know that uh, it's it's very very rare that we will find a roadmap of the conspiracy in the lower left hand drawer of the executive's uh, uh, office when we come in and do search warrants. I, I know that uh, it's been the bread and butter of many European investigations to do the dawn raids, find the documents, and then they're off to the races. And you know, as you become uh, as your as your deterrent effect increases as the profile of the, of the program improves, the likelihood that those documents are going to be sitting around waiting to be picked up, you know, is going to be greatly diminished. Yeah, so what you're looking for then is, I suppose, is electronic kind of uh, tracks, as in like, you know, records on computers, uh, text messages on mobile phones, yeah, you have, you direct have, evidence from witnesses. Uh, we have to be more sophisticated in our ability to do searches of electronic evidence, and uh, which also can be very costly. but. What we've had to rely upon then is testimony. And, Direct evidence, uh, witnesses. We, yes, and incentives for individuals to cooperate inside our testimony, and of course that, that, that brings us to the leniency program. But uh, to the extent that there are jurisdictions who spread and butter as documents and who don't have the ability mm. to either compel testimony or be able to utilize testimony, it's going to be a challenge over time. I take it on use too much economics in our cartel investigations. No. That's fair enough for folks to go down that road. Um, how do, those, do you reach into cartels that are operating physically outside the United States jurisdiction but are having an effect in America? So they're selling into America, but they're not actually operating. The meetings take place in Canada or Ireland, God help us. But how do you get your evidence if, if, they, if they physically don't ever come into the States? What's, what, what's your modus there? What's uh, well, that, so that's a very common scenario. Uh, that the documents, the witnesses, and uh, our potential targets are all located outside the United States. How we obtain the evidence, uh, obviously over, well, I shouldn't say obviously because it's, it's been a great effort, but uh, we've improved our ability uh, to obtain access to those documents through international cooperation. We've been able to, through the use of uh, treaties and other cooperation agreements, have our counterparts abroad execute search warrants on our behalf. But I, you know, uh, the, the, um, the, the most effective way that we've been able to obtain evidence is to have the companies provide that, and the way we've been able to obtain uh, that type of cooperation is through our leniency program. Mm -hmm. And a company who wants to uh, cooperate and obtain the benefits of leniency is expected to bring its documents into the United States, bring its culpable executives to the United States, and cooperate fully with the investigation. and, and uh, that is certainly the quickest uh, and oftentimes the, uh, the most effective way of obtaining okay. the information and building our cases. One of the most I suppose, uh, famous or the well, best known recent international cartels is the Marine Hoses Cartel. Would you give us an outline of how that uh, cartel unfolded, how you investigated the, the, some of the things you just mentioned arise? Of water well, itself. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, the Marine Hose investigation is uh, an exception to what I just mentioned a moment ago, which is that cartel is uh, no longer visit the United States. Um, that was a situation where uh, they were meeting in a hotel room, or excuse me, in a conference room in Houston, Texas, and uh, we knew they were coming, and we had the room uh, mic uh, and were watching uh, their conversation as they discussed uh, fixing prices, and actually, it was, if you've ever, uh, not only did they discuss future pricing, but someone decided to go to discuss the history of the cartel. And so <laughs> talked about uh, all that they had accomplished in the last 10 years and did a, we call it a Gipper speech, you know, in terms of uh, Gipper is how, the Gipper. You know, do one for the Gipper. This has been so effective and, and decided to provide a history of how effective they've been and encouraging everybody to, to buckle down and, uh, and get down to business of the cartel once again. So the very next morning, quite early, they uh, all received knocks on the door by the FBI in their hotel room who came armed with uh, DVD players and, and uh, played the tape for them. And uh, we had uh, confessions uh, on the spot by most of the participants. Um, the host, uh, those individuals, uh, they, they included um, three, uh, three UK executives. Um, so we, they were arrested. and. Um, they quickly decided to cooperate with our investigation, uh, agreed to plead guilty, and uh, 
uh, agreed to join us in recommending very substantial jail sentences ranging from 20 to 30 months incarceration. Um, yes? Sorry, how did you guys the stage for you that were going to be in the hotel room? Uh, through the cooperation of one of the participants yeah, who had come forward and, and uh, had just, uh, agreed to cooperate with the investigation. Um, then we did something that uh, we'd never done before and, and frankly the Department of Justice had never done before and that was we uh, asked the judge uh, before sentencing these defendants uh, asked if, uh, told the judge to release them from the custody uh, of the U.S. Marshals uh, who would escort them to, to the airport and uh, with plane tickets back to Heathrow uh, and let them return home. And we did that because the plea agreement provided that uh, if uh, and contemplated that they would return to the U.K. and they would cooperate with uh, the, U the OFT's investigation and were they to do that and were they to be convicted and were they to be then sentenced to periods of incarceration that either met or exceeded the jail sentences that were called for in their U.S. plea agreements, mm -hmm. then they would not be required to return to the United States and, and serve those sentences in the United States. Um, that was obviously a risk for us because we had them in our grips, so to speak, and uh, we released them. Um, they did, in fact, then return uh, to the UK, and I think most of you know, know the story. Actually, they were initially sentenced to periods of incarceration that exceeded the jail sentences uh, that were called for in their U.S. plea agreements. Those sentences were appealed, and uh, they were then dropped to the sentences that were called for in their U.S. plea agreements, and they never had to return. Uh, it's something that, uh, as I said, we took a risk, uh, but it's something we were um, we were willing to do and frankly we would do again because we are hoping uh, we benefit, that's we, I'm now speaking for you, uh, U.S. businesses and U.S. consumers by building a strong network of enforcement uh, across the world. I just described the fact that we are, um, our greatest concern is and what is having the greatest impact on our economy are these large international cartels that are victimizing our consumers. If they're operating out of the United, outside the United States, then we need, in order to protect those consumers, to have a greater deterrent impact, and we can't do it obviously alone. Uh, these cartels need to fear their competition authorities in their backyard uh, as well. And so by, if we can do anything to assist enforcement uh, outside the United States, mm -hmm. it's not altogether uh, altruistic. It's, it's done because it benefits us as, as Did well. Did you have a, an agreement in place with the UK authorities, with the OFT, in advance or was this one of these, was an ad hoc at that stage and did you put up an agreement in place afterwards? What kind of, what kind of, uh, um, well, the, uh, we were cooperating with, uh, the OFT even prior to the, uh, execution of, of the search warrants and the covert operation I just right. described. Um, uh, they were also, uh, they were involved in that initial investigation. It's also the European Union was as well and at the same time that those, um, knocks on the door were taking place uh, in, in Houston, uh, search warrants were being executed uh, in London. Uh, actually, there was, a, there was a consecutive search, first by the European Union and then uh, by the, uh, uh, a criminal search conducted by the OFT, and so that was coordinated. The OFT, they, they cannot enter into plea agreements. Uh, they can't even make sentencing recommendations, as I understand it. So there like was here. no, yeah. So there was no agreement between the parties. Uh, we have a plea agreement. There was a written plea agreement. It contemplated what I just described. But uh, if the executives have arrived in the UK and said uh, um, more politely, but uh, uh, goodbye. Goodbye. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> goodbye. Uh, kiss off. Yes. Kiss, kiss <laughs> off. Uh, OFT and uh, to the United States, screw you, I'm never coming back, and you can extradite me if you, try, you want to try. Uh, that's where we would have been. We would have sought to try to extradite them. And that was a big risk then. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I mean, it was, um, it was a calculated risk. Was it possible, for example, that the court could have imposed uh, a suspended sentence 
or it could have given maybe the equivalent of probation. If that, that was possible, I presume. All of that was possible if they had, I mean, if they had, if the court had imposed a suspended sentence that was also anticipated in the plea agreement, and so the defendant then would have been required to return to the United States to serve an, an actual jail sentence because it did not credit suspended sentences. Okay, okay. The next one, I was going to ask you in relation to international cartels was the air cargo one. Now, um, that's a little bit different. It's had a kind of a complicated history, as you know. It was quite successful in the States, I think, the investigation, but it kind of went a little bit off the rails. Do you mind maybe giving an outline of that case, that investigation? Well, that... <coughs> We convicted 21 companies and uh, about two dozen individuals in that investigation and obtained over $1.8 billion in, in fines and a number of uh, significant jail sentences. It was that's, that's the largest cartel that we've ever investigated in terms of the number of players and that were prosecuted and the amount of fines. Um, it was very successful. Um, and I think it's a cartel that uh, had a great impact on not just our economy, but economies around the world. Or trade, yeah. uh, you mentioned, uh, I think you were alluding to the uh, the OFT's case. Obviously, when we brought, well, I, I shouldn't keep saying obviously, when we brought the um, our case against BA, it was done simultaneous with uh, the UK's also announcement that uh, BA had resolved its liability and. In the UK as well, yeah. and they were simultaneously announced. That was uh, that was a, a milestone in itself. Uh, the prosecution, I'm aware that uh, aware of in the OFT and uh, with the uh, BA executives, I know resulted in a in a voluntary dismissal. I think this is yeah. proper characterization. <coughs> it was obviously a setback for the OFT. Uh, they withdrew the prosecution over the weekend. It was like a they were given time to think about it. There was a problem with the case. Yeah. Came in Monday morning. We're not proceeding. We're offering yeah. no evidence. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, how does that impact on cooperation, or does it have an impact on subsequent investigations, or is it something that's got to cause you pause for thought about how you do your work inter with inter international cooperation in mind? No, I mean that 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 individual development did not impact us. But um, look, I mean, if you uh, international cooperation. Um, you have to take the good with the bad, and uh, when you have, whenever you have a lot of jurisdictions all trying to play in the same sandbox, it, it can get crowded yeah. um, because individual. You know, it's natural that every. Well, first of all, every jurisdiction needs to look out for its the interests of its constituents, and it's going to want to have access itself to, to documents and to witnesses, and so you are going to have situations where witnesses are being tugged in different directions, and. Uh, you can also have situations where witnesses are being required to give multiple statements in multiple jurisdictions, and to the extent that those statements can be discoverable, it could be inevitable that there could be uh, contradictions in those statements. And uh, it, 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 as I said, it could get very crowded. But I think clearly the benefits uh, of cooperation um, outweigh whatever those whatever those uh, challenges are. You may, have, uh, you may be aware that we've had a number of jury trials in Ireland in relation to cartel or price fixing um, arrangements. I'm not even sure, apart from the States and Ireland, how many other jurisdictions around the world have had jury trials. You might know the answer. Um, uh, we've had three. But we, we won our first, and we've had uh, two defeats, shall we say, um, subsequently. We've had a lot of other convictions as well, people pleaded guilty. Um, what is your own experience of jury trials in the States? Are they frequent, or how does it pan out when you, when you prosecute these cases? Do you often have jury trials? Well, uh, about 95% of the individuals and companies that are convicted in the United States um, are convicted short of a jury verdict. So they have uh, uh, pled guilty to a court um, without exercising their right to, to a trial by jury. So in that sense, it's somewhat rare. I think we, we, on a typical year, we may have three, four, or five trials in a year. Oh, right. um, but this last year, we, we prosecuted 90 cases with about 130 defendants. So uh, it's a relatively small. Um, uh, we, we win more cases than we lose, but uh, we certainly, um, uh, the cases that go to trial, as you would sort of expect with the odds that I just described, are usually the, you know, the tough cases go yeah. to trial. So. We, we face our share of tough cases too. Do you do any kind of research on, on, on what juries understand in relation to Antitrust cases? Like, do they find these kind of cases complex, or do you have to go into them with a, with a view that we're going to keep the story simple? How do you? Yeah. Well, that's that's the mantra. You've got to keep it simple. Well, I mean, uh, in any trial, the challenge is 
and, and this is often also can be an issue for the judges when it was the jury, um, is to uh, have the jury look at this as a crime and the defendant is a criminal. Yep. If, um, and that that can be that can be a challenge. Sometimes the uh, the individuals involved are, uh, are portrayed as being upstanding citizens, pillars of society, and uh, and uh, the conduct is. Is uh, if it's perceived as being business as usual or something that in what we call no harm, no foul, um, you're you're going to be in trouble with that jury if they don't perceive the conduct as being harmful and, and something that they should care about and and that they should hold the individual accountable for. Okay. okay. And if we haven't been able to uh, convey that message, then we're probably not going to be successful. Do you then have specialist judges that deal only with antitrust? No. No. Okay, but uh, prosecutors, the actual lawyers, prosecutors. Yeah. Our prosecutors are all uh, antitrust prosecutors. Okay, that are dedicated prosecutors. You mentioned though that um, most cases plead out, so plea bargaining does form an important part of your prosecution process when you're coming to deal with these cartels. We don't like to call it plea bargaining. Yeah, it carries a negative connotation here, but yes, plea, uh, settlements and plea agreements is part of the the U.S. system. But the reason why I I mentioned plea bargaining is only because there's no uh, bargaining of the charges. Uh, oh, right. you, uh, what, what a defendant can attain by accepting responsibility and cooperating is a favorable recommendation uh, for lenient treatment and sentencing, but there is no uh, charge bargaining going on. Is all Gotham. Yes, yeah. uh, no, just going back to the previous, Dave's previous question about you know, conveying perceived rights to the jury, I was just wondering if you can make a distinction between straightforward price fixing cases on the one hand, more complex kind of bid really market share and type arrangements mm -hmm. on the other. Or uh, you know, do they all be regarded more as the same in the Uh yeah, I the the market allocation, customer allocation cases are much tougher to try than, than bid rigging. Uh, usually bid rigging is the easiest, price fixing next, uh, and the market allocation, but that's I don't know if it's necessarily because it's harder to explain it. Is it's usually uh, mm. the the conduct is more limited. I mean, if you have a if you have a customer allocation agreement in which uh, uh, you take uh, uh, everything east of Mississippi and I'll take everything west of Mississippi, if it's working well, they never need to communicate with one another after that. So there's very little. Uh, policing or implementation evidence that we can use to show the existence of the agreement. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it's, business was always done. Well, if you have something like that, and uh, um, you're going to have a hard time proving the existence of the agreement. So uh, the allocation cases are, are tougher for that reason, I believe. So would you then carefully pick those kind of cases so you'll maybe avoid going to trial or dealing as a criminal case, maybe the, the market allocation, cost allocation cases? Sorry. Well, uh, 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 as federal prosecutors, we have to believe that we have a better than 50% chance of getting a jury to unanimously believe that they're uh, and convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. So if we think we don't have the evidence, uh, mm -hmm. we can't bring the case and we can't pursue a plea agreement uh, okay. or make some sweetheart deal just because we think it's a tough case. Okay. So I don't know that it... Uh, uh, tough. If we have a tough case that we don't think we can satisfy our evidentiary burden, then we just don't bring it. Just as, a, as, a, as an aside, our first plea trial was a price fixing case. Um, all our plea, uh, I suppose, it'd be a case where it was pleaded out were price fixing. But the first jury trial we lost was, in fact, a uh, market sharing customer allocation case. And we're looking at this, going, well, what lessons do we learn from it? And it seems, again, it's just, you know, they get the message, juries get the message of prices, price fixing bad, but this market sharing thing kind of a little bit more complex than to grasp. So maybe it's, it's an experience we, we could have maybe learned from yourself in advance. Um, I just want to go on if I can, um, you know. I've heard a comment made um, more than once recently that the Department of Justice is becoming a little bit, um, maybe a little bit too reliant on leniency, on the immunity program, and that maybe that this is having an impact on your ability to um, investigate off your own bat. In other words, where you get complaints from Joe Public or you do your own scoping or whatever, that you really are maybe sitting back a little bit too much, waiting for the minute applicants come in, they present the case to you, and the job is done. Maybe I, I don't want to sound like I'm insulting you now, I guess, but is, is, is there some truth in that? Or, I mean, how many of your cases are literally built on just <clears throat> immunity from the first stop? 
No, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's certainly not the way I would perceive it, that we're too reliant on leniency programs. First of all, we look at the leniency program as an investigative tool. So in some ways, it's, it'd be like saying you're too reliant on search warrants. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have a full arsenal of tools available to us. I mean, we, we, have, we can do search warrants. I just mentioned we work with the yep. FBI. We just talked about our ability to obtain wiretaps with the authority of a judge or even without the authority of a judge. If we have an individual who's cooperating, uh, we can do what we call consensual monitoring. We're able to take uh, witness testimony, compel it before grand juries. So we have a lot of uh, advantages that uh, aren't necessarily available to other jurisdictions around the world, but we still find that the leniency program has been more effective than all of those tools combined in terms of detecting cartel activity. So uh, it is uh, to say that we are too reliant on it, uh, to me, is sort of um, suggests or misses, Defense a little, talk. misses a little bit about uh, how, it is, how it is utilized. But mm. we also, uh, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but a huge proportion of our investigations are generated through our Amnesty Plus program. Now, the Amnesty Plus program involves situations where we are investigating one crime, and the, uh, one of the subjects of that investigation, who is too late to get leniency on that product, uh, uh, through its own investigation, now determines that it's involved in a second, <coughs> completely unrelated conspiracy, and brings that to us. Now, if we aren't perceived as a credible investigative body, there's no incentive to do that. Um, but of course, uh, we well. I uh, I hope it's our reputation. I believe it's our re reputation that that there. Uh, if the company doesn't go out and find this, we will. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we do engage in what we call cartel profiling techniques. Uh, we have our what we call our penalty plus program to provide incentives to companies to go out and find this before we do. But we are on the lookout for this related okay. conduct through the other investigative tools that we have. So to the extent that companies are coming forward there, I think it's, it's, it's an indication that uh, we are being vigilant in going out and finding new conduct. We're just providing incentives and hoping that the companies will bring it to us first. Well, immunity can arise after investigation starts. So you may have an old initiative investigation, you have received complaints or a tip off, you start investigation, and at that stage maybe somebody might come forward to look, I need to come in. Yeah. That was one of the, ch when we revised our program in 1993, one of the changes was to make leniency available even after an investigation begins. Now, you still have to meet the first condition, which is you have to be the first. So uh, uh, oftentimes, if we, when the company finds out that, uh, when a company or individual finds out they're under, under investigation, it may be because we already have a leniency applicant, so it's not available. But if we don't have a leniency applicant and our investigation hasn't progressed to the point where leniency is no longer not available because we're too far along in our investigation, Let's assume it, uh, we uh, are sending out grand jury subpoenas, uh, conducting investigation. If it's still available, we will attach a copy of the leniency policy always. to the subpoena. An attorney can always ask us, is leniency available? If the answer is yes, all of the targets then or subjects of the investigation will know that now they're in a race for it. So it usually doesn't take long before someone comes in if if everybody finds out simultaneously that they're all receiving the same invitation at the same time. But then if you get a subpoena and there's no leniency attached to it, you know you're out of the race. Yeah, it's too late, yes. That's a, that's a case of maybe ringing Scott and see if there's anything you can do for me. <laughs> but anyway, um, given uh, the street we're on, I'm going to ask you a question about a chap called Norris. Um, it's, a, it's a joke that a lot of the audience will know about, but um, there's a presidential election going on at the moment here in the country, and one of the candidates is called Norris, lives with two doors up. Um, but the Norris I'm thinking of is um, this gentleman in relation to this extradition saga with the, with the UK. Would you mind giving us a background of that story? I mean, that's been going on for some time. Um, yeah, uh, well, you know, it, it goes back, you're right, it does go back some time. Um, it just it just really came to an end, though, a week or two ago when the Supreme Court finally said they would not uh, hear any hear the appeal. He'd, uh, appealed it all the way, or tried to appeal it to the High Court, but uh, they weren't willing to, to hear his case. But it began a long time ago. Um, look, uh, I was saying uh, eight years ago what I'll say now, which is the conduct that uh, was involved there was the most egregious obstruction that uh, I've observed, that I'm aware of uh, in my 20 years. And I say that because it involved 
Mr. Norris was the CEO of a major international company. <coughs> Uh, his involvement in obstruction beyond his involvement in orchestrating a price fixing conspiracy was as egregious as I've seen. It involved the, the whole gamut of obstructive conduct. It involved putting together a team of uh, executives to destroy, to search out and then destroy documents. It involved creating false scripts that were submitted to the Justice Department to uh, uh, to um, to try to mislead us in terms of what the nature of agreements were, uh, meetings that took place. And it also involved approaching a competitor and providing them with a copy of the scripts in order to try to tamper with their testimony and get them to go along with uh, so the- So supporting witnesses as well. The new, yeah, so it was the, it was the whole gamut. Um, Mr. Norris's subordinates uh, uh, who were directed to participate in this conduct uh, decided to accept responsibility. Um, several of them traveled voluntarily back to the United States and served jail sentences for their involvement in this uh, in this obstruction and the conduct. Mr. Norris decided to take another tack. Um, he proclaimed his innocence. Uh, he left his subordinates to hold the bag and um, and uh, tried to hold out in the UK and refused to return and uh, take his case to a jury. And it, um, as you know, he was. Eventually, he was extradited. He was returned to the U.S. and uh, after trial, he was convicted and uh, sentenced to 18 months, um, where he he now sits. That's a kind of a light sentence when you think of what has happened. And was this, was it you know should he have again speculating? I suppose what, did he get off light? You think? No, uh, no. I mean, I, I don't. I don't. I think 18 months is a substantial sentence, but. Uh, I think his penalty was much greater than that. I mean, he's been living with this for 10 years. His decision not to accept responsibility has meant that he has spent the last 10 years with this case. Had he accepted responsibility as his, for not just his conduct, but for the conduct of his subordinates, he could have been living his last uh, eight, or t eight years or so in retirement. Instead, uh, he has, uh, he's still dealing with this. He's still now sitting yeah. in jail, and, and frankly, uh, uh, it may be that that's the, the harshest part of this sentence. What was 18 months for, though? Was it for obstruction or for his price fixing? Or? No, he, it was purely for the obstruction. He was only allowed to be tried on the obstruction charges. He was, uh, we were not permitted to try him on the price fixing. That seems a bit anomalous. Sorry, Noreen, what has it? Yep, please, Noreen Mackey. Uh, Noreen Mackey, I was just going to ask you in relation to sentences. Yeah, you referred there to that being uh, um, a substantial sentence. And I think you said earlier that sentences of 20 to 30 months were substantial as mm -hmm. well. And that was actually for breaches of the competition laws. Mm -hmm. So you would consider something around two years to be a substantial sentence, prison sentence for breaches of the antitrust rules? Yeah, our, uh, I mean, we uh, the maximum sentence under the antitrust laws was uh, moved in 2004 from three years to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's the maximum sentence, and we have had some uh, individuals who have received much longer sentences. But do I believe that uh, an 18 months you know, jail sentence, uh, or 20 months or 24 months sentence is substantial? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's a heavy, heavy price to pay uh, for the conduct. Has the increase in the sanction available to the courts been a direct correlation with the actual increase? I mean, have you seen an increase in the amount of time being handled by court courts, yes. or are they reluctant to give uh, longer sentences? Well, our, our uh, judges um, have, uh, have have a good deal of discretion, so I can't uh, mm. characterize all of them uh, as acting uniformly. But we have, over time, and uh, by that I mean in the, over the last two decades have seen uh, judges uh, sentenced with increasing severity in our cases. And you know, that's maybe been part of the education um, process uh, in terms of seeing that the harm it has caused, not just in antitrust cases, but in other white collar crimes. But uh, the jail sentences have gone up over time. And as you know, I should say, and I, you know, it's, it's important people hear from the antitrust division uh, and talk about the need for tough sanctions. We've already talked about the fact that it's not the antitrust division that imposes sanctions, and it's it's the judges that do. And I mentioned that, and of course, it was our Congress that decided that the sentences maximums that I just described mm -hmm. were not harsh enough for individuals. We uh, we had a one million dollar statutory maximum fine um, in the 70s, and then it moved to uh, ten million dollars. Uh, 
uh, about 20 years ago, and now it moved to $100 million in 2004. So we've seen, you know, two tenfold increases over the last couple of decades, and, and that was Congress, not, not the antitrust division that made that decision. Do you have any view, though, that um, the potential of such increased um, sanctions, 10 years or substantial fines, does that itself have a deterrent effect, or is the fact of being, people being caught and receiving jail time, which, you know, is it a combination of the two, the fact that people are going to prison, that's working as a deterrent? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think just having the law in the books is going to be enough to deter the conduct. There has to be, um, there has to be that fear or risk of detection um, without that... Uh, I, I, without those sort of headlines in the newspaper, you need something in the Wall Street Journal that says executive goes to jail for yeah. 18 months for price fixing. Um, uh, that, that's that's worth its weight in gold in terms of deterrence. But just having something on the books, there's, you know, you know from your work with the ICN. I mean, uh, there are plenty of jurisdictions that have actually longer statutory maximum sentences than the United States, um, but they're not being, those statutes aren't being utilized, and so they're not carrying the necessary deterrent impact. Because we, at the moment, um, there's a, a new bill out, a sanctions bill in relation to competition of law in Ireland, uh, published very recently, where the maximum sentence available is proposed to increase from five years to ten years in indictment. I think one of the reasons that this is being sent out is this idea that it's important for cartelists to know the severity of the sentence they can find, they can um, uh, receive, but also send a signal to the judiciary that look, that's you know, we, the intention here is to punish these wrongdoers, not just merely to find them, but actually to punish them. Is that part of the purpose of, of that sanction as well in the states? Well, uh, yes, I'm aware that in some jurisdictions, for example, you may have uh, some offences in which the statu- if the statutory maximum is three years or less, then presumably jail sentences actually are not to be imposed at all. And so yeah. I have seen jurisdictions that are trying to get up to a certain uh, minimum level so that judges will understand that it is actually the intention to utilize these sanctions as opposed to treating them as a second-class crime. I don't... Uh, I'll give you... Our, we have something called uh, well, wire fraud or mail fraud, which right. is a type of uh, you know fraud statutes. They carry... 20-year penalties. An attempt to fix prices can be a violation of that statute. So when Congress is debating whether to raise the statutory maximum from 3 to 10 years, they knew that if you actually attempted to fix prices, you could go to jail for 20 years, but if you were actually successful, you could only go to jail for 3 years. That didn't make much sense. So um, sometimes it's a, sometimes there, you're right, there is a um, uh, the, the level of the statutory maximum should and is meant to carry a signal in terms of how it should be perceived with respect to other crimes. Yeah. And, and that message is meant for the judiciary. Do you see any link between criminalizing uh, cartel activity um, and maybe simply just treating it as an administrative type um, an infringement where there's maybe uh, fines and the effectiveness of the deterrent uh, um, are, you know, so in other words is criminalisation in your view the right way to go in relation to price fixing does it involve that element of wrongdoing kind of um, in, in the mind of the perpetrator that warrants its treated as criminal and therefore do you think likewise criminalising it is the right road for deterrence purposes well, it won't surprise you that the answer to that is yes, but uh, from my perspective, I, um, I have the opportunity to, um, you know, to talk to audiences like this outside of the United States, and I and try to be careful not to be too preachy uh, or come across as such, um, because I do think that uh, uh, I do think that every jurisdiction is uniquely positioned to decide what is best for its own businesses and its consumers. And what's best in the United States will not necessarily be best in other jurisdictions. I've just described it. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we put a lot of people in jail, and there's obviously a societal cost to that. And so another jurisdiction could make the decision that uh, uh, that's not how uh, – we don't want to treat these as crimes. We don't, we don't want to fill up our prisons with white-collar executives. And uh, – that's not the road that is best for our our consumers, and presumably they have elected officials that are looking out for the best interest of those consumers. And if that's the decision they make, then uh, it's certainly one that I would respect. Um, and so you can have this uh, healthy debate on what are what's 
what's the best road, what, what sanctions are most appropriate. Where I don't think there's any room for debate and, uh, is what actually is the most effective way to deter the conduct. That's, uh, to me, not up for, for discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, so the fact that they're stopping at your, at your borders yeah. and staying out there. Exactly. In my opinion, uh, the greatest deterrent is individual accountability and the risk of going to jail. Mm -hmm. And so without that, I think you're leaving. You, if, if the jurisdiction or its elected officials make a determination uh, not to have criminal sanctions, I respect that as long as there is an understanding that it does leave their economy and their consumers more vulnerable to cartel activity. You know, beyond, uh, it's not just, uh, I begin with individual accountability and uh, the risk of prison sanctions is where I think the rubber hits the road on deterrence. Yeah. But, but you also, you mentioned criminal, I mean, just, just the criminalization of it also carries a stigma. Um, if you sentence an individual and they have a criminal record, a felony record in the United <coughs> States, um, you're not, or even a company is risking being labeled as a criminal. You're not going to get the same impact with an administrative sanction or administrative fine, which you know some individuals actually might <coughs> wear as a badge of honor. Um, you might be interested to know that on some of the sentences we've had uh, in our own criminal cartel cases, one of the biggest um, concerns of the uh, individuals, apart from the possibility of going to prison, is that with our connections to the states, does this mean I can't go to America anymore? And it seems, in fact, that's a, you know that's a major impact of these people. The fact that they'll have a criminal record and they won't be able to travel to the states. Now, it's possibly on, on personal reasons they want to go to America, but also business. Yeah. Of course, um, you have kind of arrangements with, with, with some jurisdictions whereby you know if you do um, come in, maybe plead, whatever else, they can you can waive that kind of as an issue in future. These kind of par these bargains have been entered in the past. So you want to mention that? I mean, there's one or two of the international cartels have actually freely um, uh, submitted themselves, come into the states. Well, this this goes back to the <clears throat> 90s. Um, after the ADM case that I mentioned in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. uh, that was our first international case. We had a string of them afterwards, but at that point in time, we, you know, we were trying to get access to foreign located documents and foreign located witnesses. And if we could just get one of those individuals to, re to accept responsibility and plead guilty and come to the United States and testify, we were willing uh, to promise uh, a, a recommendation that we would not seek jail sentence. Um, that's where we were in the 90s. And that was still not good enough to get anyone to return to the United States. So we also, because they were worried about the immigration consequences mm. of pleading guilty and then being excluded from traveling into the United States for business or personal reasons. So we went to the, uh, the immigration authorities and we entered into what was then uh, and is still today uh, a unique arrangement in which the immigration authorities would agree to pre-adjudicate the immigration status of the individuals even before they pled guilty basically providing them with uh, a promise uh, that they would n that their criminal conviction would not serve as a bar from entering uh, and leaving uh, the United States if they cooperated with the investigation. Uh, so that ended up being a huge uh, tool in terms of incentivizing uh, uh, foreign nationals to accept responsibility and voluntarily return to the United States to plead guilty. Now, you know, the rest of the story was as we became uh, more effective uh, in being able to build these cases and having a stronger hand in these negotiations, uh, by the time we got to the end of, of, of that decade, by, by 1999, we took this no jail deal off the table. We said we'll continue to provide incentive for individuals, including foreign nationals who have violated the U.S. antitrust laws but would like to. Uh, put this matter behind them, but they will need to uh, agree to plead guilty and now they will face a jail sentence. <coughs> and we also made clear that those jail sentences will be relatively short uh, for now, but we will steadily seek to increase the sentences over time because ultimately uh, we are looking to create proportionality in yeah. our sentencing and, 
and our vision uh, over time will be that it, uh, sentences for equally culpable individuals should be the same regardless of nationality. Because the incentive courses for business, business executives from outside the states who base themselves so much in the states, make sure you're outside the states when this thing blows up because then you can cut a deal or you get a light sentence. <coughs> so in a sense it's kind of, you eventually you're kind of working toward making sure these guys get this kind of similar kind of sanctions to American-based. Well, as you would expect, the Justice Department, we would like to be perceived as uh, having a fair, equitable, and proportional yeah. policies, which would treat everybody the same, regardless of nationality. The reality is, is that an individual that's outside the United States has um, a strength in their negotiating position. Uh, if we're not able to bring them back, now obviously a case like uh, Ian Norris's yeah. has been important in terms of uh, diminishing uh, that. Uh, that concern, as well as other policies. I mean, we now have, if you are, if you violate the U.S. antitrust laws and you're outside of our borders, uh, we will seek to put you on an Interpol red notice watch for the purpose of tracking the, uh, right. tracking the movements of those international fugitives, hopefully seeing them detained and extradited back to the United States. So, And is that used much? Have you actually red flagged many um, suspects? Yes. That's interesting. Right? And, I mean, I, presumably that means they may have travelled to Ireland, for example, or else, and authorities here will be notifying through Interpol that, you know, X individual um, has been true here, and, else, and you're watching these guys and then actively looking, trying to ch chase them down. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, right? You mentioned, um, we, are, we discussed leniency in passing. Um, the Stolt Nielsen uh, case has had an impact, I think, on uh, DNC. Uh, can you give an outline of that case and wh how it's impacted on your program? Well, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the case, but um, it's the only time in the, we have a DNC program that dates back to 1978. We revised it in 1993. Uh, uh, this company came in and sought leniency, I believe, in 2002, and uh, then had its leniency revoked um, by the Department of Justice. So uh, since 1990, well, since 1978 or since 1993, it's the only company that we have revoked leniency for. So it, it was obviously a significant uh, in that regard because it's a one-of-a-kind case. Um, I think I would use up too much time to give you all the facts of the case, but suffice to say, uh, the company had its leniency revoked because when it came forward, the reason well, uh, we found out about the case, like everybody else, we read the Wall Street Journal and it talked about a general counsel that was suing its company, uh, its, his former employer, alleging that he uh, had detected a cartel, he tried to put a stop to it, and the conduct continued even after he discovered it and tried to put a stop to it. So he had to um, resign from the company so as not to be perceived as a participant in the conspiracy and sued his former employer for his <coughs> constructive termination. We read that and uh, opened an investigation and quite promptly his employer came in and sought leniency. We have a condition in our program that says uh, when a company discovers the wrongdoing, it has to take prompt and effective action to terminate its involvement. The way that 99.9% .9 of the companies do that is report the conduct to us. That's the best way, the most surest way to meet that condition that you have put a stop to it is to come and tell the Department of Justice. This company did not do that. Uh, it did not come forward until some time after, and again, not until after the Wall Street Journal reported on it. We told the company that uh, they could come into the program, but if, the, if it turned out that the general counsel's allegations, which they told us were meritless, if it turned out that they were true, that is, it said that the conduct continued after he discovered it, well, uh, they would not be eligible. They assured us that uh, the company had immediately ceased its involvement in the conspiracy afterwards, had notified all of its co-conspirators that uh, they were out, and, uh, and our internal investigation would verify that. Mm -hmm. So we provided them with a conditional leniency letter and then promptly found out uh, or uh, had witnesses tell us that that had not been true, that the whole thing had been a head fake and that the conduct had continued. 
So they had their leniency revoked. They challenged that decision in court. A judge had an evidentiary hearing. The judge determined that the conduct had been discovered, uh, but did not find the testimony of the government witnesses that it, it had continued was credible, and so uh, reversed the Department of Justice decision to revoke the leniency, and the company uh, was, uh, the, the indictment that was levied against the company was dismissed. Um, it, I will tell you that it's, uh, and I'd be interested in anyone here who has a, has a, has a different take or a different view, it, it certainly hasn't hurt our leniency program. Okay. I mean, that was, that was in 2002, and we haven't seen the tailing off of leniency applications <coughs> since then. It's also not a situation that I would think, uh, well, that we, the Stolt situation is not one, frankly, that many com that the companies find themselves in, or frankly, it's not one that I, that I, that I care to, to comfort them about. So again, and what I'm talking about is the, what was uh, undisputable is, is that the company discovered the conduct and decided not to immediately report it. Instead, undisputably, the individual who was in, the top individual involved in the conduct actually was in charge of conducting the internal investigation, mm. also not something that I would encourage. And his second, who was the point person in the car cartel, was charged with meeting alone with co-conspirators to communicate that the company was withdrawing from the conspiracy in one-on-one -on -one meetings oh. uh, after that also. Not an effective way, I would encourage, no. in terms of withdrawing from a conspiracy. So, mm -hmm. so to the extent that someone would look at what happened in that case and and be concerned that, well, if we discover the conduct and we don't put an end to it, but we try to handle it the way that was handled and stole, can I be sure that the Department of Justice uh, will still welcome us into the leniency program? Uh, you know, signals uh, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not that concerned about that. I would like to see now if a company instead discovers the conduct, immediately reports the conduct. You have nothing in common with Stolt, and you have nothing to be concerned about. A couple of questions flow from that because it stru strikes me in relation to our own immunity program. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but it, it, we do things slightly differently. One, this idea of you know notifying all your conspirators, um, that would be a, a problem for us. We, we, we would ask, uh, where possible, that an immunity applicant uh, takes effective steps to bring to an end their involvement in the cartel, but please don't tell them why, because of course, by the time we get ourselves sorted out and get up to, up to speed, anything we're looking for in relation to documents or whatever else could well be destroyed. That must have been a concern for you that they actually went and spoke and told. I mean, well, they did that before they ever came in. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, no, no. Um, yes, it is a concern. Uh, we don't. Um, uh, it's it's a concern in every case mm. that uh, particularly when when companies come in as they often do and report ongoing conduct, uh, it's very important that uh, that their application remain confidential so that we can utilize all of our covert investigative tools. Um, we tell a company uh, to make sure uh, we want to know who is it in the company that is aware of the MSD application. We want to make sure that the company council communicates to those individuals that we that their name was given to us as someone who is aware of the investigation. Uh, we know exactly when they became aware of the investigation, and should that individual have any communications okay. that result in any obstructive <coughs> conduct, that not only will they lose their protection under the program, but they will now face additional potential obstruction charges. Can you parse it then? Can you can the company still continue to get immunity, and some selected say directors, whilst Directors that have um, behaved badly whilst having you know, you know, applied, yeah. they can be thrown out of the program. Uh, yes, that can happen. If the company has done everything that it can to protect the integrity of our investigation, um, but notwithstanding that one of their individuals has decided to make a mess of it, then, then the company can still remain in good grace under our program uh, and the individual can be carved out and subject to prosecution. That actually happened in. Uh, uh, in the DRAM investigation. All right. A, a second question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just me. while we're on leniency, I just uh, wanted to ask. Um, you've mentioned the number of times. Yeah, you've mentioned the number of times Scott um, people accepting responsibility. I guess that's you know companies or individuals saying yes, you know confessing their kind of guilty involvement in the crime. 
you know, went blind for leniency. Mm-hmm. So at what point must they do that in order to get leniency? At the very start of the program or through it or what, at what point? Uh, this has um, been a progression over the last uh, 20 years. A development that I think is good for the leniency program because it's good both for enforcers and for applicants is this the development of a marker system. We are, our message to companies, and I just sort of conveyed it in different terms a moment ago, is, you know, run, don't walk to the Justice Department. As soon as you have a whiff of wrongdoing, we want the company to come forward and report. But we, and we want them to do that before they've conducted their internal investigation. So the marker for getting into the leniency program, the evidentiary threshold, especially for, for uh, if we don't have an investigation, it's just about as low as it can be. Um, frankly, if you have any indication of any wrongdoing, you want to come in and get a marker so that the company conduct, can conduct an internal investigation. They're going to be given that opportunity to do so, and while they have that marker, nobody can step in line ahead of them, regardless of someone who comes in with a stack of documents and the roadmap, uh, the whole with, with everything with a bow on the top. It's too late. <laughs> They're back of the line. So uh, you don't have to come in immediately with a corporate confession. Now, what they want is a piece of paper, though, a letter from the Justice Department that confers conditional leniency. Um, and in order to give that letter, they have to confess to a crime. I mean, the, the leniency program is only available for people who need it, and, it's only, and they need it because they have committed a crime. You can't come into the leniency program and say, well, <coughs> uh, our executives participated in uh, meetings with their competitors in smoke-filled rooms where prices were discussed. And I could see why you might uh, think that there was price fixing going on there. It certainly looks bad. None of our individuals will admit to it, but uh, we think you have plenty to work with. That, that's not going to get you into the program. I mean, either there's a corporate confession of wrongdoing and uh, 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 in which the leniency program is there for or not. So okay. you can come in with with just uh, this initial lead, but in order to obtain the benefits of leniency, there has to be a full admission of wrongdoing. That could be a problem, though. Sorry, sorry I was coming in one second, but just struck me that it could be a problem where a company, say, due diligence has maybe bought out a, a, um, a competitor or whatever, and discovers, oh, hold on, something's happened here, and they want to get in quickly before they obviously get, get their place in the queue, but they themselves are not entirely sure what's happened. So in a sense, they may well come into you looking for um, uh, immunity, but not necessarily agreeing, we don't know we've actually broken the law or not. Or no, no. But, that's, that, but that happens all the time. And then it could be as they, as they move and conduct their internal investigation and try to perfect their marker, all right. they may uh, determine that there is not an antitrust violation, and then they, they exit and uh, uh, without, um, uh, they are able to exit the program without having a mission of wrongdoing, and quite often we our, our investigation gets closed right behind them, and uh, they're able to do that uh, without uh, being subject to civil lawsuits because okay. we're not publicizing the fact that there's an investigation. The whole matter is handled uh, confidentially and uh, outside of the public, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, that that happens. Uh, but that's not ir- irregular. Okay. So that's right. Phil Andrews has a question. Can we quote you on that, Philip? One of the outputs, I think, of, of the BA um, Virgin case, as, as, as I sense it, on, on the side of the waters, um, a fair amount of skepticism towards towards immunity uh, applicants, I think, and perhaps that's that's very long in circumstances. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing here in relation to our immunity program is that the Competition Authority um, objects to assertions of legal privilege by immunity applicants uh, or has concern about it. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I can understand as a prosecutor anything that gets in the way of an investigation can be viewed as offensive, but. Um, <coughs> Would you have a US, a, a US view on, on that in terms of you know, ensuring that your immunity program is sufficiently appealable at one, on one hand to people to come in uh, and you know, allowing people to assert their, 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 their rights um, in that regard, and on the other hand also ensuring that you have you know, sufficient skepticism to know that you're getting the right information and how you make that balance? Well, uh, first of all, I would caution 
anyone to against reaching any firm conclusions about the ability of the OFT or any other enforcer to obtain a conviction with the use of the leniency program based solely on the OFT case. That was, uh, I understand why the OFT brought the prosecution, but keep in mind that was a two-firm conspiracy in which, you know, one company got leniency as well as all its executives to testify against the other company. That is the rare case. In fact, you know, uh, that, um, <coughs> this is the wor this is the worst case scenario in a, for a litigation context, and that, frankly, it's also the worst case scenario in many jurisdictions in terms of why uh, a prosecutor would not want to confer leniency. I remember going around when we were I was talking to other jurisdictions about leniency, and they said, "Well, what about the situation if it's a two firm conspiracy? Surely we can't give leniency to one company just to prosecute the other." And I said. Well, look, then, then don't do it, but then make sure that your program says the leniency program applies to all violations of, of our Competition Act except for two-firm conspiracies. Right. Go ahead. Make that distinction as long as it's transparent and predictable. So I, uh, I think they chose, and were the toughest of circumstances, uh, a two-firm conspiracy, and you know, had there been five members of the cartel and one was a cooperator against the other four, I'm not sure you would have... You, uh, it, it carries the same dynamic with the jury. We have always had to rely upon the cooperation of insiders, some of whom were just immunized as opposed to pursuing the conditional leniency program, and we've been able to obtain conviction. So I, I don't know that uh, I'm not. Sh I, I don't know that I would. I, I would hope that it wouldn't be the case that uh, every case would be perceived the same way as OFT, uh, the same way as the BA case. With respect to. Um, legal privilege. There is a provision in the OFT's uh, immunity program that requires companies to waive attorney-client attorney, attorney -client privilege <coughs> in certain circumstances in order to have met their obligations to cooperate. That provision does not exist in our program. So we do not require companies to waive attorney-client privilege in order to cooperate fully with our investigation. Now, having said that, uh, we expect the companies to provide us with a full roadmap uh, to to our to what they have discovered and to uh, assist our investigation. To give us the documents, to point us to the witnesses, to bring those individuals in, to facilitate their cooperation, and so forth. If we ever were in a situation in which somebody's ability to cooperate fully was inhibited by legal privilege, then the company would have a problem. It would be the, you know, if, the, if the company said, we would love to cooperate with you, but we can't because the information that you need is protected by privilege, that would be the company's problem, not our problem. You wouldn't get into the program then if you couldn't cooperate fully as a result of that privilege. What we're not interested in, though, is having access to the interview notes that the attorney took the first time he spoke to uh, the employees. We're not something I know that was conveyed in the BA uh, case. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in obtaining a copy of the investigative report, which was provided to the board of directors. Uh, that's not information that uh, we take in our investigations. We wouldn't ask for it. We wouldn't need it. Um, so, do we respect attorney-client privilege with respect to those types of materials? Yes, we do. Um, uh, but. Uh, and it hasn't resulted in uh, inhibiting our investigations. D does that answer your question? It just struck me, um, before I ask other uh, questions, uh, the second question I was going to ask in relation to Stolt Nielsen, under the Irish Energy Programme, an individual can apply, so that it doesn't absolutely have to be, for example, a corporate application. An individual involved in a, in, in a conspiracy might come forward where the company is not willing to, and he may well um, benefit from unity. In that case, it seemed, from, if I'm right, you had an individual who was a good citizen, saw what was going on, and told the company, and eventually resigned. Was immunity available to him as an individual, as opposed to just the company, or could he have done something else? Could he have just gone and reported it? I mean, why didn't he come to you guys? At an early stage. Uh, well, we do have an individual. I can't really speak to his motivations, yeah. but uh, we do have an individual leniency program. It is available uh, to executives, and they can come in and beat their company in. Um, it's uh, 
it, it, it frankly, it's it's very effective because I think it helps spark the race. I mean, it doesn't get used nearly as often as the corporate leniency policy, but I think it's very important to have so that companies understand they're not only in a race with their competitors, but they can also be in a race with their own employees if they don't do the right thing. So I think it has been a, an important part of mm. the success of our corporate leniency policy. A member of the team in the authority um, had a question that I want um, asked to put to you, and I, I'll try and uh, nuance if I can. What methods of questioning are favoured in relation to, um, well, first immunity and then second suspects? I, I think, um, not necessarily suggest that you work them over or anything, but um, I, 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 I take from that that um, um, is, for example, uh, arrest, detention, and questioning used as, a, as, a, as an investigative tool? And again, do you, for example, in relation to immunity uh, witnesses, do you record everything, video and audio? I just, I mean, is that the kind of way you go about it? Or? Well, we don't, we don't do arrest, detention, and questioning. So I at mean, all, no. Oh. Uh, well, because we, uh, that probably wouldn't get us very far. We can't. If we're going to, we can. We have the ability to compel testimony. Uh, but only by conferring immunity on the individual. So we can um, uh, we can take people, uh, we can subpoena the individual, require them to testify in front of a grand jury. Uh, that process is uh, not public. Uh, the individuals uh, who appears is put under oath and subject to penalties of perjury for providing false information. The individual can be compelled to testify, but if they assert their Fifth Amendment right, which of course they're, enti yeah. uh, they're entitled to do, then we can obtain a court order to require them to testify, and, thereby, and, and that can be a very important way to get to the truth. The, um, in terms of the leniency program, we do, we, we do things much different, for example, than uh, the European Union does, um, because as I mentioned a moment ago in response to this gentleman's question, what the company provides through the leniency program is a roadmap. They provide us the documents and they point to the individuals who are involved in the conduct who can assist us in our investigation. But it is the documents and the testimony that's the evidence, not what the attorneys say. Uh, with the commission, what they're looking for is a corporate confession and the corporate confession is evidence. And so they used to want that corporate confession in writing, and now they've adopted this paperless process in which you can speak into a microphone and make a corporate confession. But in both, both situations, what the company lawyer says is evidence. That, that, that's not the case in the United States. So they're not interested in sitting down and talking to the actual participants. They would like the company to provide that information and make a corporate confession. So. And that way, the systems are, are quite different. Um, but we will, with cooperators, we will sit down with the cooperators. Uh, actually, the immunity program is also uh, helpful to the extent that the individuals and their employers now, the interests are aligned, so they don't need separate counsel. The corporation can represent the individuals. They all have the same interest, which is to tell us everything that they know, because they both benefit from that. Now, if we're in a situation where the individual uh, where leniency is not available, we think there's an inherent conflict that exists between the individual and the company. The company has the ability to improve its situation by, by providing uh, cooperation against its executive. The executive has the ability to improve his or her position by providing mm -hmm. testimony and cooperation not just against uh, the other competitors but also against his or her own employer. And so uh, there's inherent conflict that exists, and an attorney cannot represent both the company and the individual uh, and live up to his or her ethical obligations. Uh, so that becomes sometimes a problem in our investigations, and it sometimes requires us to then do our questioning in front of a grand jury where attorneys are not welcome. Right. It, it just strikes me, though, that if you're compelling somebody who has, I think, Miranda rights, they have this right to you know that. Uh, against self-incrimination, would you then compel them through a court process to give, give evidence? You can't be sure as to what evidence they're going to give because you don't have a statement from them. They haven't been a willing witness up to that point. And whenever a prosecutor not knowing exactly what they're going to say, surely the defence will be entitled to know in advance 
what this witness is proposed, what evidence it is proposed that witness will give, so they can prepare the defence. In other words, if you are seeing this for the first time, is not going to undermine uh, defence rights in a, in, a, in, a, in a prosecution, or is it done differently than that? Because it, it wouldn't happen here. I mean, you have to actually have the statement of evidence of what they're going to say given to the uh, accused in advance, so that this is what the witness is proposed to say in, in evidence. Well, we, uh, yes, if any statements, so we've now moved ahead to the litigation stage. Yeah. If we're going to trial, uh, well in advance of trial, well, actually, actually the law only requires that the statements be provided uh, no, uh, no later than after the witness testifies, but before cross-examination, but we've moved well away from that, and usually the statements are provided prior to trial, sometimes well in advance of trial. And yeah, any witness statements have to be provided with her, and that could be um, that could be the statements that were given in front of a grand jury. Uh, in other situations, it may be uh, a write-up of a of a statement, an interview report. Sometimes has to be provided. Okay. But uh, witness statements are, are often made available. What, in your opinion? Sorry. Sorry. Just to, just to be clear, my you you would not know though before the witness testified before the grand jury what the witness was going to say, would you? Well, it would depend. If we have someone who's cooperating with our investigation, then we've probably sat down and interviewed that witness before the grand before their grand jury appearance. Before you had to get a court order to yes, um, yes, we no, we wouldn't. Um, has that ever backfired on you? Uh, well, that we obviously have some witnesses then who provide hostile testimony or whose testimony is not very neat because where it's, you know, like pulling teeth uh, in front of the grand jury. Um, sometimes we voluntarily put ourselves in that situation because we do not want to interview the witness in front of uh, counsel who we think will help try to shape that testimony. There may be reasons why we are concerned that uh, the witness is not interested in uh, telling the truth and so there may be some documents <coughs> that we would like to show that witness for the first time in front of the grand jury. Uh, because we're concerned that with more preparation they may finesse their testimony. Um, but we experience all different kinds of uh, results in front of the grand jury. Skoski, I think Kieran has a question. Kieran, yeah, please. Sorry, Kieran, I'm the competition authority. Uh, I have a question, but I just, uh, just make a very brief comment. The competition authority does indeed respect uh, legal privilege in immunity. And it's just that we don't always accept that. Uh, you know, a lawyer can, or a company can hide behind the privilege. We just need to know uh, what it is they have. So it's not that we disrespect the privilege. Mm -hmm. And my question, just for that, is, for the fact that we said, in relation to markers, and we have a marker system as well, uh, under your agency program, do you have a set time limit by which uh, applicants must perfect the marker, or is it at your discretion? It's at our discretion. And I, I <clears throat> in my opinion, fixed time periods are counterproductive for the competition enforcer. Um, it's often the Department of Justice that wants to continue to extend the marker process because we're not quite satisfied um, uh, that we've received a full corporate confession and we want the company to go back and do some more homework uh, in order to perfect their marker. So we always have a finite uh, marker period, so we will if a company comes in and wants to conduct an internal <coughs> investigation and it's, it, it, it has an initial lead but it has a lot of work to do, maybe it has to travel uh, abroad in order to conduct interviews, we'll give the company, say, 30 days to conduct that investigation. We expect the company to, to remain in close contact with us. We want to know the, uh, not just, we want to know what the game plan is. We want, as I said, we want to know who they're going to be talking to. Uh, we want to know who the circle of individuals are that are going to be aware of, of the application. And we're going to need to be convinced that the company is moving in good faith, moving with uh, due diligence to perfect its marker. If at the end of this finite marker period they have demonstrated both good faith, good faith and diligence, but they need more time, or we think they need more time, then we will roll, we call it rolling over, roll it over for another fixed period of time, so it's never indefinite. And uh, you know, sometimes we have two, three, four marker periods that are rolled over as the company continues to conduct its internal investigation. If we thought the company was dragging its feet, if we thought the company was not moving uh, in good faith, forward in good faith, then we could revoke the marker on that basis. But it's not uh, that's 
it usually does not come to that. I have, oh, Gerald, Gerald, Gerald. Um, Gerald, Gerald, um, uh, judicial plea bargaining seems to be an important element or a background element in your, uh, the success of your agency program. And I just wonder how the Senate judge um, scrutinizes the dean that you would have done with the applicant uh, when the matter comes before the judge. Um, uh, yes, so plea, uh, plea agreements and settlements are an important part. Our leniency agreements never go in front of a judge because there is no criminal charge, and so uh, the leniency program is outside of judicial scrutiny. When it comes to uh, plea agreements with individuals and companies who, who reach agreements with the Department of Justice, there's two types of plea agreements in our system. Um, and there, the shorthand reference to them are uh, B agreements and C agreements. Uh, we do a lot of C agreements in international cases because a C agreement is a type of agreement in which the United States enters into an agreement with the defendant. The agreement calls for, uh, there's a joint recommendation as to what the appropriate sentence is. When it comes to the judge, the judge is free to accept or reject the agreement that was reached between the parties, but cannot modify it. So if the judge does not like the sentence, uh, he or she can say, I'm not going to impose it, in which case the parties can rip up the <coughs> agreement and start over. Uh, that's favored in our international cases, particularly with individuals, foreign nationals, because they would like certainty in terms of what their sentence is going to be. Oftentimes, they're facing a 10-year statutory maximum. Under our sentencing guidelines, the sentences would be uh, much stiffer than what they've agreed to, because we've taken into consideration their willingness to voluntarily surrender to, to U.S. jurisdiction. But they want to make sure that the judge isn't going to sentence them to something longer, and so they want a C agreement. The other, some judges won't accept C agreements, or in some cases, anyways, we use B agreements. And a B agreement is can also include a jointly recommended sentence, but the parties understand uh, before the agreement is accepted that the judge is in by no way bound by that recommendation and can sentence how the judge sees fit. Uh, we have we have a very independent judiciary. I, I hear many times uh, talking abroad about how settlements won't work because their judges are very independent. I can assure you our judges uh, also have an independent streak. But I think in uh, antitrust cases, and it's probably true of white collar crime cases, they know the defendants are well represented, they're well funded, and they're well represented. And uh, concerns that they may have about whether or not a defendant has been um, adequately represented and whether or not this rep truly represents a knowing voluntary disposition are usually dispensed with quite quickly. And so our judges quite often, uh, and I hope they feel the same way about the Department of Justice, that we've looked out for uh, the interests of our constituents and uh, uh, with, with uh, high frequency accept the recommendations of the parties in our cases. I have just one final question myself, uh, Scott, and it's, um, I suppose, in your opinion, uh, what do you see as being the optimal uh, enforcement model for cartel enforcement? Um, and I suppose, speaking from our own perspective, we would certainly agree in Ireland that criminal enforcement is the right way to go in relation to cartel enforcement. Um, we, we were at one point, I think, almost unique in, the, in Europe. Um, it's beginning to grow a little bit, but your own view, um, what is the optimal way to go about uh, cartel enforcement? What's your own? Well, I, I think I've, I, I've, I've spoken to the sanctions part of this already. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I told you that I, uh, it, uh, when, I, when I was discussing the, my views on criminalization and why it may not be optimal in every jurisdiction because uh, because of cultural, institutional, and uh, 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 morals of uh, different jurisdictions could come out differently on those issues. So I won't I won't repeat that that part of it. I do think that um, I think we certainly have advantages in our system that we have a competition authority and a prosecuting authority that are one and the same. Um, I think that uh, if you don't have that, then you really do need dedicated competition prosecutors. And this is where I see a lot of jurisdictions falling down, is that uh, they don't have a, a justice ministry that has dedicated uh, competition enforcers, um, and they don't have a they don't have 
with the separation, uh, they had lack of coordination in terms of the administration of the leniency program, um, and that's why you see a lot of competition enforcers, particularly competition enforcers that have the ability to levy <coughs> administrative sanctions, even though it's also a crime that could be prosecuted by prosecutors where the criminal sanctions are not being utilized and the competition enforcers are not seeking to have them utilized because there's a bit of a turf battle or at least there's, there's not a... Uh, a hand-in-glove um, symmetry that exists between the two enforcers. So uh, if there is going to be criminal sanctions, then there has to be a respect from the prosecutors of the leniency program. There has to be a great deal of coordination, mm -hmm. and I think there has to be some specialization on the justice side as well. Okay. I don't have any more questions from, from the audience. I'll throw in the corner. John McNally. Yeah, uh, Scott, to what extent do problems assist uh, following up action legitimacy? Uh, well, <clears throat> yeah, we, well, first of all, we, um, I guess we give them the greatest assistance of all. We detect the crime to begin with, <laughs> uh, number one, and then we do, and when we get a conviction, we, we give them also the, the benefit of prima facie liability in their cases. So in the United States, if you are convicted, of an antitrust offense, that conviction establishes prima facie liability in the civil action, and so liability is no longer at issue. The <coughs> question is what the damages are going to be. Um, That's different here, by the way. Yep. Even if you've got a conviction, you still have to prove from the from the, from the start again in a follow-on civil case here at present. Although there's a provision being brought about in our new competition amendment bill, uh, which is just published, that will hopefully address that problem. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. Yeah, but so. Uh, those are the sorts of head starts that are provided, um, but we we don't then turn around and uh, when we're done with our case, hand over our investigative file. There's obviously with the leniency program, for example, uh, we we promote and respect confidentiality uh, for leniency applicants, so we're not uh, handing over uh, information that's provided by a leniency applicant uh, to anyone, whether it's uh, the private plaintiff bar or the Irish Competition Authority or uh, enforcers in the U.S. We try to. We, we, it's an important part of the assurances that are provided to leniency applicants. But uh, um, the, uh, there are significant advantages that are provided to private plaintiffs in the United States that I'm aware are not available here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, perhaps, what the gentleman is Canadian, by the way. <laughs> Excuse me, I said. We forget so you. Speaking about the, um, there's a, if I recall correctly, there's a statute. Uh, if if provide single damages as opposed to double damages, mm -hmm. if you cooperate mm -hmm. and you provide the file to mm -hmm. um, to the follow-on action, then you only get single damages. Is that, is that so like it's called Act Para, and uh, it was another way to try to incentivize cooperation through our leniency program. Uh, as, uh, you may be aware, if you violate the antitrust laws, you have this prima facie liability if you're convicted and then you face in a civil action the, the possible treble damages, which is triple damages plus joint several liability for triple damages across the entire conspiracy. That's what a normal conspirator would face. If you are an applicant in good standing with our uh, amnesty applicant in good standing with the Department of Justice and you cooperate with the plaintiffs, it's not us providing the file to the plaintiffs, but if the amnesty applicant cooperates with the victims, then the amnesty applicant can be uh, take advantage of the statute, and they see their then their exposure reduced from triple damages to single damages, and then there's the elimination of joint and several liability. So they're only responsible for single damages, which is, which actually brings them back to what they're required to, under our program is to make restitution. It's also a requirement of our program. You have to make restitution. You have to make the victims whole for your own conduct. And so now there's that, that equivalency. Are they responsible for only the customers that bought from them, in other words? Yes. Because, of course, in a cartel, if, um, if I bought all my stuff, from my products from you, you might be gone. I'm still entitled to sue other members of the cartel, even if I haven't bought from them. But that's actually an advantage then for that party. I just wanted to say, folks, um, we have actually run over time. Unless there's a really pressing question, we probably should bring things to an end. Um, I'd like to thank Scott 
for uh, making his uh, making a fantastic effort to be here, especially today for for, um, for this uh, seminar alone. He literally sure. has, he's flown in for this and he's leaving imme- almost immediately to the airport to go out again. Uh, although there's an ABA conference on for the week in 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 Dublin, uh, he hasn't been here for that purpose at all. Came specially for this uh, this event. Thank you very much, Scott, and also thank you to the IIEA for organising today's event, and of course to you all for coming along and for your questions. Scott Hammond, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.